Hi, everybody. Glad you came back tonight. The Astro Imaging Channel's got a good show for you. Gary M. is going to tell us about the compendium. This man takes marvelous pictures. He puts them on Astro Bim. Yeah, a lot of people do that. A lot of people do that. But how many of them make a, what is it, 420-page book out of the thing? Uh, 54 megabytes or something like that. Maybe I'm exaggerating. Maybe I'm not. I don't remember exactly. But he's just got this collection of stuff for us to look at. And we are going to look at it in a minute or two. But before we do that, we gotta we got to make sure that we're all getting ready for um, next week and later weeks. Um, first thing I want to do is go to the calendar. And on the calendar, you'll see that... Um, Gary M's here tonight, and then Molly. Molly's going to do a special show next week. She went to the uh, Okie Tex, and she and Larry Groom and probably some other people got together and took a video of some of the imaging rigs there. And she said, she's told me personally, that she did a much better job than I did last year when I tried to do the same thing. So we're all going to sit here and watch Molly's version of the imaging rigs of Oki Techs and see if she really did a better job. Okay, we'll see. Uh, Detlef and Eric are getting together the week after that, and they're going to tell us about folded refractors that they've been working on. They do some solar imaging with it. Pretty cool stuff. And then we have a change of plans, all right? Um, Agapio Elias is going to be here, and the Marta opposition is coming up on December 8th. And Agapio came in and did a two-part series a while back on planetary imaging, and it was very well received. Everybody really liked it. And uh, he said, hey, um, I, I can come in and do some stuff like that, and, and that'd be cool, wouldn't it? And I go, yeah, and it's kind of timely. It's timely for a couple of reasons. One is we have a TAIC workshop coming up. That's where we supply a set of data, and you guys process it as well as you can and submit it to us and show us what you've got right now we are offering one on uh, using uh, terry robeson's uh, ngc 55 which is a pretty little galaxy down in the southern hemisphere and we just wanted to see how you could do it and uh, get you to volunteer you can get the information the, the zip file with all the data here and then you can submit it here and you need to submit it by november 20th which is next week and only one of you have done so so far so you need to get that data into us and because you hadn't yet we decided that maybe december 4th would be a a little short to have that presentation for you so um when agapios came in and said hey you know what i've got some more to tell you about how to image mars we said yeah we'll take you up on it so we're going to go back to the calendar. You can see that uh, we've got a Christmas uh, coming up uh, and Happy New Year. We aren't going to have meetings there. We're pretty full through January. And then in February, we're empty. So we need you to go hit the contact button here. Tell us who you are and what you'd like to present. Now, a couple of people have asked me, you know, I, I, they told me that I'd like to present something. But, you know, I can't think of anything new. You don't need to think of anything new. We've had 400 some shows. You aren't going to think of something that has not yet been done on the Astro Imaging channel. But I bet you you can think of some things to say that haven't been said. I bet you you can show us some things that haven't been shown. Um, or you can take the same old, same old stuff and show us much better than the last guy to do it. Okay? So don't be timid about presenting something that has already been presented perhaps two, three, four years ago, somebody did something about how so-and-so or such and such. Go ahead and present your version of it. I'm sure that you will enlighten people. Okay, uh, enough about all that stuff. Please get a hold of us and volunteer to do something. Um, and we are going to go back to the meeting. We've got everybody sitting over here. I am going to stop sharing because it's time for Gary M to tell us who he is and what he has for all of you. Gary, take over. Okay, uh, first I'm gonna figure out how to get up on the screen here. Am, am I up on your screen? Um, yep, you're coming, you're coming up. Okay, okay great. And great. you've got the meeting there, so we're all at the meeting. 
Great, thank you, Alex. So first of all, I want to say good evening and good morning to a lot of my friends and, and whoever's tuning in actually and not watching Yellowstone tonight. Um, I appreciate you joining. Some of you are watching, I know, in other parts of the world where it's not convenient time-wise, so I appreciate that as well. Hopefully this will be worth your time. I'm going to talk about a compendium I put together um, over the last five years, and it's um, a lot of material to cover, and I will go through that very quickly. This will be recorded, and you can play that back if, if there's something missed. You can also ask questions. I'll stop for questions several times. and. Um, with that, then, uh, I'm going to get started. I'm going to go through this fairly quickly. I've got a presentation to go through, and then I'm going to go through the book itself, which is a PDF file, and then the, the spreadsheet. So I'm going to start um, and, and just introduce this compendium uh, in a strange way, actually, by telling you how to download it. Because I know a lot of you are good at multitasking. And while I give this uh, five-minute introduction, which you know is not probably the most interesting thing, you can go ahead and ignore that and simply download the compendium. So this is how you do it. On this slide, there's two files. There's a book, which is a PDF file, and a spreadsheet, which is a, that's, that's wrong, it's an XLS file, uh, Excel file. And you can download new, numerous places, uh, but probably the, the easiest one would just be to go to my homepage, which is www.garyim.com. If you click on that, it'll bring this up, which is my homepage. And then if you click at the top, which is compendium, you'll see two buttons here, one which will automatically download the PDF file, which is about 40 megabytes, and one which will download the spreadsheet. These are both free. And uh, just go ahead and do that now if you're so inclined, and you can either follow along. And the reason I encourage you to do this is not, not so much to follow along, although you could do that, but by using it or by getting into it, at least you'll become familiar with it, and it'll be easier than uh, for you to use, use it for real. Uh, as time goes on. So, um, Gary, can I ask yeah. you on the very bottom of your screen, there's a little hide. Can you click on that little hide? That stop. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Great. Okay. So, what I want to cover here quickly is the spreadsheet file. Uh, in the second revision, we're on the second revision of the compendium now. Um, I think I think I put out the first revision in July and now the second one in, in September. The second one has a lot more detail in the spreadsheet, and uh, I couldn't but help but use macros to do calculations like the location of the moon, the, the objects, uh, sunrise, sunset. And so this year, Microsoft started blocking those macros in all downloaded spreadsheets. So in order to get that function to work, once you download it, it's very simple. You just find your downloaded file, right click on it, it'll bring up a menu, you click on properties, and then when properties comes up at the bottom of that on the general tab, which is the first tab that comes up, it'll say unblock at the bottom checkbox. So just unblock that. And that way, all of those macros, the numbers will show up and things will work instead of just being blank. And finally, at the bottom, this is all free, uh, but if you do use it and, and enjoy it, I'd appreciate any donations to a GoFundMe account that I've set up, which is in the PDF file and the spreadsheet, you'll see a link there. And this is simply a scholarship fund I'm trying to put together for astronomy college students. I currently have about $1,000 raised. I'm hoping to raise about 10, uh, just to try to give back a little bit to, uh, to students that uh, are trying to make a career out of this hobby that we love so much. We, I personally have benefited so much from uh, work that people in the past have done in terms of, especially in terms of publishing papers and so on. So it's just a simple way to try to give back. So let's get started here. I'm going to go pretty quickly. So um, I gave this talk a year ago on the on my ARP uh, imaging collection. And in there, if you go back and check on the Astro Imaging channel last year, uh, you'll see a, a longer introduction about my setup here. So I'm not going to do that here tonight. I'm going to go through that fairly quickly. I imaged from Alaska, Texas. I've done this since 2016. I currently have about 1,860 images on Astrobin, um, mostly deep space objects, representing about 9,000 hours of imaging. I've actually developed a lot more images and that and spent a lot more time, but that obviously as time goes on, you upgrade the images. So anything, usually I take my old images off. It's not worth keeping those old ones on there. They're kind of embarrassing at times. Uh, as some of you know, I end up spending about five hours per image, uh, which is probably on the low side, but I'm not in this to generate pretty pictures, to be quite honest. I just love seeing new objects. So I don't image like some of my colleagues do for 10, 20, 80, 160 hours on, on an object. And so my objects are never going to make, uh, you know, the cover of some or, or uh, some of my friends out there have galleries and have just beautiful pictures. 
I've got okay pictures, uh, but but I like seeing different things, and that's why I've imaged so many of them. Uh, and I just find that five hours per image for most objects does me a, a pretty good job of capturing enough detail uh, that I can see um, and enjoy what's going on. I've got Bortle 4.5 skies, which is basically between rural and suburban uh, areas. I have a setup. I, I retire, and I'm very fortunate to live on the second biggest lake in Texas, and I face my telescope pad has an open view to the south and so i'm able to image all the way down to the horizon down to minus 53 so there's a lot of objects in the southern hemisphere that i've been able to enjoy that way i do have four telescopes two refractors which, which are both takahashi 85 millimeter which is what you call a wider uh setup and then my medium setup which would be my 130 um, millimeter uh and a thousand millimeter focal length which is kind of a medium uh medium slow setup and then my my slow setup which is my 2800 millimeter that's uh the f10 S sct which is a celestron uh, c11 and those first three are what i've done all of the imaging in this compendium with um the last one here the rasa i'm getting set up right now i've taken a few images with it that's really the the whole right now in the compendium is what i would say large faint objects done with a fast system and i'll have that set up hopefully up and running here in a few days I do use uh, CMOS cameras, ZWO exclusively, and I've had good luck with those as well. Um, so the compendium, uh, this started, I, I enjoyed putting together compilation posters for Astrobin, and I'll, like, it started with the Messier uh, collection catalog. I think everybody starts with the Messier catalog, and it's fun just to put, you start putting a few on the poster, and eventually you're obsessed with trying to finish that entire 110 object collection. and. That's how it started with with putting these compilations posters together, but it, it expanded from SA to others. And people encouraged me to put out a book or some way that they could access all of these posters in one place. And that's what this compendium is, is really a lot of the posters that I put in one place. And the purpose of the compendium is to help astrophotographers in finding interesting deep sky targets. It can be very hard sometimes. You, they're, they're, it's tempting just to set up and go out there and just kind of find what's there, look for what's there. But there's effective ways of trying to find out what what's targets are, are coming up on the horizon, what will be available away from the moon that night. And so hopefully this compendium will help some of you uh, uh, do a better job in trying to find objects that are really interesting to, to image. There's three components to the compendium. There's a book, which is a 420-page uh, ebook. Uh, pretty simple to use. There's no macros involved. It's just a PDF file. So with 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 hyperlinks, I'll show that to you. There's a spreadsheet, um, which is a pretty big spreadsheet. It's it's you know 3,000 objects and over 100 columns. And the advantage there is it's a sortable database with all of the collections and catalogs cross referenced to all of the objects. And in addition, I'll show you there. It identifies the best objects for you to image on any given night. It asks for your location and for uh, time of day, and uh, it, it'll try to help you find the best objects for you to image on that evening. And then finally, the third component is uh, Astrobin. So a lot of us are very familiar with Astrobin. So both of these are linked to Astrobin. So if you click on anything in these documents, it'll typically take you to Astrobin and show you the full resolution image, show you all the detail about what equipment I use, and then a just detailed description of that object. Um, so although each of these can be used on their own, I think the real power here is, is how they're all integrated. So when you click on a link in the, in the spreadsheet, for example, it takes you immediately up to Astrobin and you can see more detail on that. So I've tried to make this more of an electronic document than a coffee table type of book. The content, um, there's 3,000 uh, different deep sky objects in the compendium. Um, I've only imaged about two thirds of those. And so those uh, objects, I'll show you, there's 27 different object types. And I image down to, to minus 50 degrees. It's only objects that I've been able to image from my house here. Uh, so obviously, I'd love to put more Southern Hemisphere objects in that are past a minus 50. And someday, if I get a chance to spend some time down there, maybe I'll be able to capture those. Uh, but right now, it's limited to objects above uh, minus 50 degrees. The objects are crop reference to, to 28 catalogs. And like I said, I provided images for uh, 1,922 of these objects in different collections. And I'll explain the difference between catalogs and collections here in a minute. And all of the images are my images. And the reason I say that is because when I started, I, I probably on my bookshelf here, I probably have more 
books and uh, magazines and web links than, than just about anybody on, on finding objects in different collections. And uh, the best of those in my mind were, were where the objects were consistently imaged. So I'll give you an example. Rick Johnson, who unfortunately passed away about four years ago, has a wonderful website. It's still functional where he has 1600 images and has an image of, of the object and a brief description. And that was very useful for me because they were very consistent images. I knew that I couldn't quite image objects as well as Rick could. And so if I saw an object that I looked great, I knew I probably could capture that one. If I saw one that was very faint, I, I knew it would be a, a challenge. And so it was nice to have the consistency as opposed to a magazine or someplace where they have Hubble images next to some Sky Atlas image. And you have a, a, a variety and it's hard to know what to expect at the end of the day when you image. So I think the fact these are all my images make it a little bit easier for you to get a handle on what to expect at the end of the day. You don't want to spend 10 hours on something that doesn't turn out. These are the different object types. Uh, the 27 object types are shown here that I've included in the compendium along with the number in parentheses is a number of those objects that are in my compendium. So you can see it's a wide range of, of types of objects from asterisms to just plain stars and star clouds, a glob of the clusters. Uh, you can see the biggest category here is simply galaxies. I tried to break the galaxy category up, as you can see here, into things like chains and clusters and groups and dwarfs and ellipticals. But then I had a big chunk of what I would say, you know, simple spiral galaxies. Um, and I had a hard time trying to divide those further up. So as time goes on, maybe I'll figure out a better way to do that. But the, the advantage of having these types defined in the spreadsheet is that you can go out and if you want to just um, look at molecular clouds that evening or looking at elliptical galaxies, you can just pick that type, isolate that, and look for objects that are in that category very easily. I'm going to show you now that the, the 28 different catalogs that are, are included. These are all cross-referenced to the objects, as I'll show you here in a few minutes. And um, the first category that you see here is called general catalogs. Most of you are familiar with some of these catalogs anyway. And with each catalog, like the NGC catalog, which is the largest, I'm going to show three numbers here, and maybe it's it's getting into too much detail, but the three numbers are, the last number is the easiest, that's the total number of objects in the catalog. The middle number is how many I've included in the compendium, and then the first number is how many I've imaged. So you, the, the first number is the, the number I've imaged, the seconds are they in the catalog, and the third is the total. And so obviously where all three are the same is where I've imaged the complete catalog, and those have the asterisks here. So the general, what I call general categories, what I mean by general is that it has all of the object types included, uh, whether it's galaxies or planetary nebula or uh, regular nebula or clusters. So they're, they, they encompass a broad range of different types. And you can see I've got the NGC and IC. And by the way, in, in the spreadsheet, there are mouse overs in all of these different places to explain the catalog, the day it started, who started it, giving a little bit of background. I, I like to try to understand some of the basis behind these, this history because it is it's our history and it's nice to understand that the herschel 400 for those of you that don't know what that is it's, i think there it was in florida where an astronomy club in 1980 picked 400 of the original herschel objects and they're not all seven seven thousand eight hundred forty of the ngc objects like me there's 2500 so they took for the herschel 400 they took the top 400. And then, of course, we get into these next six here which are all um i think very interesting uh catalogs, and I'm going to talk about those in more detail, but it starts with Messier, which most of you are familiar with, Caldwell, and then I'll get into these here on some of the next slides because these are more obscure. Uh, you may not be familiar with them, but they're all tied together in a very interesting way, in my opinion. The galaxy catalogs are a different category. Those include ARP, um, which is what the presentation I gave last year on my ARP collection, Hickson galleries, uh, Able galaxy clusters. These are large. So Hickson's are small clusters of four to seven galaxies. Able are from 10 up to hundreds of galaxies. And then the more obscure UGC and PGC designations. I don't have a lot of these. You know, you can see there's 12,000 UGCs and I've only included uh, images of 124 in the compendium. Those are the galaxy catalogs. There's planetary nebula catalogs. I've imaged the complete Able catalog as I'll show you and the Griffiths catalog. Uh, and there's Kohotek and Minkowski here as well. And then star clusters, uh, globular clusters, these are all the clusters in the Milky Way, 157 globular clusters and, and 1100 open clusters. And then finally, the category of nebula. And here we've got the Barnard Dark Nebula, the Gum Nebula, which are the Southern Emission Nebula, 
Lynn's Bright Nebula, Lynn's Dark Nebula, the Sharpless Catalog, 313 objects. Uh, the SNR, Supernova Rendment Catalog, um, VDB, which are Reflection Nebula, and then Wolf Rayet, which are Emission Nebula from very, very strong, uh, large, massive stars, which are some of the prettiest nebula out there. So those catalogs are all concluded. You can sort the spreadsheet by any of those catalogs and see objects in any of those if you so desire. So uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about these six under general because they are related in an interesting way, and I want to show you how that works here very quickly. So there's a progression in these general catalogs, and in total, if you take all seven of these, I actually have added another one now, but if I take all seven of these, all seven contain objects. There's no overlap. They're all unique. And so they, they contain 764 total objects that are all unique. And, and as you progress through something like the Messier catalog and are looking for something different, these are the other catalogs that you can go to depending on what interests you have and what you're looking to image. So Messier is where it all started, of course. 1700s authored by Messier, 110 objects. You can see the breakdown of objects here, uh, mostly galaxies, but also a ton of clusters. And uh, for those of you that have imaged the entire Messier catalog, you know that halfway through the clusters, it gets to be a bit of a long haul. Uh, but you know, there's something about finishing that Messier catalog. And that was basically what people focused on. Of course, this was a visual basis. People put these first catalogs together from the visual perspective, not from an imaging perspective. So 1995, um, Sir Patrick Moore put together, uh, working for Sky and Telescope, or I don't know if he worked for Tele Sky and Telescope, but it was published in, in Sky and Telescope in 1995. And these are 119 objects that, that what Sir Patrick Moore felt was uh, very interesting objects, not necessarily the next best 109 objects in the sky, but interesting objects. He's got some, some very odd things in here. Uh, he's got um, uh, some, some objects that, that, that are just have more historical significance than in terms of beautiful significance, but, it, but an interesting list. And it's, it's probably, I would argue, just as interesting, if not more interesting to image than the Messier list. But again, this was developed from a visual perspective. And the reason that it's called the Caldwell list instead of the Moore list, because his name was Sir Patrick Moore, is that he was, his full name was Sir Patrick Caldwell Moore. And he didn't want to use the word M for Moore, which is his name, because of, they already had a Messier list which started with M. So these are the C objects, Caldwell. So if you see C, C10, that's the 10th the Caldwell object. And then, uh, some of you may have seen this in, in, in 2007, Stephen James O'Meara published a book called Hidden Treasures, where he went the next step and picked the next 109 most interesting objects to see in the sky and broke those down in a very similar manner. So these are very similarly comprised lists. You can see they all have a lot of clusters, a lot of galaxies, and, and some other interesting features. And then again, uh, Stephen James O'Meara, and these are books, if you haven't bought them, they're used, they're on Amazon, and they're, they're very good books to have, published Secret Deep, which is simply the next 109 objects. So all of these objects in the first four columns are all unique, and they're all, I wouldn't say all interesting to image, but there's a lot of them that are interesting to image here. And I, I've imaged all of these, uh, except for a few of the Caldwell, which I'll explain in a second. So these four, first four in total, uh, comprise uh, 437 objects, but they were all developed as visualists. And so when I got involved, there were a lot of great objects that weren't included in these lists. So the natural thing for me to do was simply to pick the next 109 objects, but to focus more on objects that I like to image. And I'll show you the, the orphan beauty list. I call them orphan beauty simply because they were left out of these first four, but they are beautiful objects. And, and if I was just gonna pick one catalog to image, it would probably be this one. And I'll show you why here in a, in a little bit. And so I put that together in 2020. These are all objects that are, I call fairly large. I mean, they're bigger, they're all bigger than four arc minutes. So uh, you can view it with uh, a lot of these with, I would say, medium sized scope. I did all of them with 100, with either the 400 millimeter I had or the 1000 millimeter full point scopes I had. Um, so you don't need a huge scope for these, but you do need a huge scope for the next column because after I put that together, I put together something called good, uh, small packages, which is, you know, good things come in small packages. And um, these are all objects of four arc minutes or less. So you could do all of these with your 1000 millimeter scope, but uh, I did a lot of them with my 2800 millimeter scope. And, uh, and, and surprising though, even with a thousand millimeter, how good the image is with today's processing tool. So you'll see that, uh, in this small package, there's a lot of galaxies here, and that's where. It would, and I'll show you uh, 
that catalog here uh, in a few minutes. And then one I'm starting to work on because I just just obtained that Rasa scope is something I call Faint Giants, and I hope to publish this in 2024. And these are these are not published in any kind of book way. The, 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 the three that I've done, these are just all electronic. But there are a lot of tremendous objects out there to image that are simply faint, large, uh, primarily nebula. And uh, I really want to do those justice in uh, this last. So this last column will be uh, objects that weren't included in these first six, um, but that were still interesting objects to image. So that gives you, as an, as an imager, it gives you 764 objects. Uh, right now, I've imaged uh, the, the first six uh, sets, and I'm working on that last uh, catalog as we speak. One thing I will point out, if you're going to attempt this, is just realizing those first four, there's a lot of clusters. And as I've mentioned before, that, that can be uh, fun uh, for a while, but uh, it does get uh, it does become a challenge, you know, to keep the momentum going after a while. So I've kind of, for mine, I've, I've stayed away from those uh, clusters since there were plenty of clusters identified in the first part. I'm going to switch gears now and go from this catalogs to collections. So catalogs, uh, you know what catalogs are? Collections are simply characteristics of things that I thought were really interesting. And, and these are just things I put together. Uh, sometimes there would be a few lists out there for a few of these, but most of the time through my research, I would just over time collect things. And typically these collections are maybe 10 objects to, to 30 or 40, they're not 110. And so let me show you an example of a few of the type of collections that I have uh, compiled in the compendium. And we'll look at some of the images uh, later. So the first is galaxy types. So you can see here we have uh, grand design galaxies, which I think you know, are some of the most beautiful galaxies out there. Uh, and then we, we, we just have the Magellanic galaxies, Flocculon galaxies, super thin galaxies, and then a list of all the brightest galaxies. And so these are all just different types of galaxies. And I've got more that I just haven't shown here. Uh, structures, galaxies that form hexagons, galaxies that are shell galaxies, galaxies that have bar lenses or ANSIA, and I'll show you examples of these. Uh, rings, so this includes things like uh, nuclear rings, polar rings, collisional rings. Collisional rings is, is probably one of my favorite, and I'll show you that here in a few minutes. Uh, pseudo rings and then inner rings. Star streams, again, I love star streams, and these are, are objects that have either single or double tails of star streams, either super long star streams for almost a, a billion light years long, loops and umbrellas. And then just as an example of non-galaxy, there's, there's, I have something called, uh, obviously I've got all the nebula, which I'm not showing here, but the star-related collections, which include asterisms, bacalabules, uh, Herbie Caro objects, proto uh, uh, planetary nebula, and then young star objects. And I'll show you some of these. These are interesting to image. Again, a lot of these star-related ones take a, a bit more powerful scope. So with that, I'm going to uh, just quickly, uh, before I stop for the initial set of questions, I'm just going to take you through a summary of each of these documents before I actually show you the document. So the next thing I'm going to show after the question break is uh, the PDF of the book. So the book, I just want to emphasize here, you should navigate through the PDF file using the bookmarks. I've tried to put these hyperlinks in there to make it easier to fly back and forth and see different things, and I'll show you how to do that. After the introductory sections, there are four main sections of the book. I have a top 100 target list. There's 23 catalogs and 37 collections, which are, are, are kind of pared down from what's in the spreadsheet because I felt it was just trying to keep the book to a reasonable size. And then at the end of this book, I've included a table of 3,000 objects, which are the same 3,000 in the spreadsheet, uh, but it's an abbreviated table. It's not sortable. It's just there for people that may not have access to the spreadsheet. The spreadsheet itself, the power in the spreadsheet is that it has all of the objects listed and then mouse over images of each object so you can quickly see all of the different objects and then click on that to take you to an Astrobin link with more detail. So trying to fit all of this into a manageable size spreadsheet, which also includes all the calculations I show here for determining whether the object is visible at different times of day and moon phase and so on. It, it took a lot of power and I, I, in terms of computer power and I had to not maybe do everything I wanted to do because I was starting to get really bogged down and require just tremendous computing time. Right now, right now you'll see, uh, at least on my computer, which is kind of a medium computer, if you make a change, like if you sort or you change time of day, it'll take about three seconds for everything to recalculate. And I was trying to keep it to that or less. 
And then one thing I haven't mentioned here is that uh, I do have all, for all the images in the spreadsheet, I have all the image data. So I show you the filters I've used, the pixel scale, field radius, the focal length and all of that. You can get that on Astrobin as well, but it's convenient in the spreadsheet to have those pieces of data to be able to sort on. This shows you briefly, and of course I'll bring up the spreadsheet here in a minute, but this gives you just a snapshot of what that's, I don't expect you to be able to read any of this, but just, um, just gives you a feel for, for, for what it looks like. And I'll take you through each of these sections um, as we get into this a little bit later. And then finally, uh, each link hyperlink takes you to the Astrobin account. I know most of you are familiar with Astrobin. This is the type of information that you'll see um, along with the detailed description and a full resolution down, download, downloadable image of the object as well. So all of this is trying to give you some context on what these objects look like and where to find them. So I think um, with that, I'm going to just uh, stop here briefly and just see if there's any any questions uh, from Eric, if he could. Uh... Yeah, we're watching the chat, Gary. Uh, I, I have a question. Are all these links to your images or do you link to somebody else's images ever? And that's a good that's a good question. These are all my own images. Yeah, I've given that some thought. Obviously, it could be easy enough to open this up to some friends in the Southern Hemisphere, for example, and and uh, add on that way. But I was I was just trying to keep it um, simple from my perspective. And so right now, it's just all my own images. And there's a question here. I think we're puzzling over a little bit. Maybe if I read it, it'll it'll let's see. Eric uh, William expanded on his question a little bit yeah later, i see I, that okay so column s has shades of blue white and red there is a disclaimer at the top of the column stating use of narrowband filters allow you to shoot into the red somewhat what yeah. type of filter is gary using to build that a three nanometer or say a 12. no that's a great question and so what he's referring to, uh, can you enough? Can you see my screen here with the Excel sheet? Mm -hmm. Yes. So right here, there's a column called Moon, and for each object, the objects are listed in the left column here. But for each object, it shows you the separation between the Moon and the object, and then it gives you an index. And the index um, will be colored red if, in my judgment, the Moon's just too close based on the phase of the Moon, which you see up here on the top, and the separation. So it's colored red. It's just it's just too close to get decent images. And then, so you want to wait until uh, you get more into the blue zone. And I'll show you that once I get into the spreadsheet. But when okay. I, that comment though, what that's about is you can shoot closer to the moon when the moon is bright, if you're shooting narrow band. Now, my images in the compendium are all done with three and five nanometer. I, I wanted to, um, I debated between those and let's say six. Uh, I, I don't think I'd go up to 10, but um, but I, anyway, I shoot at three. But either way, you know, whatever you do in three or five, I think my point is that you can encroach more on the moon. Uh, and a lot of you do that. I've seen that in Astrobin. Um, you, can, you, can, you can get closer to the moon than shown here if you want to use the narrow band imaging. Well, at least you can do it with hydrogen alpha. Uh, oxygen, That's right, yeah. It's, kind of it's harder with the yeah, that's right. It's harder with the uh, the uh, okay. O3 filter for sure, but you know, in S2 you can do it as well. Okay, I'm I'm not clear on it. Gary could um and I'm also suffering from the fact that there's a time delay between the YouTube presentation and the meeting presentation. So now I'm back in the meeting presentation. Would you put your cursor on the red blue green column? Yeah, it's right here. Oh, red. Well, this is the red blue column, but that the question was about. Uh, that's what I'm saying. That has does that have anything to do with the color of the filter you are using? No, no, absolutely not. Okay, no. I think that's the that's the confusion. I think. I'm sorry. Yeah, red means if if you're just using basically red means if you're using broadband, if you're using just RGB or L, stay away from that. Don't don't image that object right now. And if it says blue, like this one here that says 59 because it's 117 degrees away, then that one's okay to go after. So the colors there, the green in this column is telling you it's at a proper attitude, and the blue in this column is telling you it's far enough away from the moon to go after. But it has nothing to do with which color filters you're using. It's just that you're using a broadband filter. You, 
shoot the blues. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you see, William, it, it really doesn't have anything to do with the uh, with the uh, band pass of your narrow band filter. It just it, it's just like it's just like the red red green yellow stop signs as to yeah go ahead and do this one get no don't do this one and red means yeah don't waste your time with it gary do you have any um calculation of good targets for this evening yeah yeah, yeah. is that something you're going to go over in the next segment um yeah, well, just to answer that question you have. So this is the spreadsheet here. If you look at this, I'm going to click on this now button. Mm -hmm. so now this is 2106 as I show right now here. And so if I right now what I'm showing here, if if I if I mouse over here, I'm just going to show you the top. I'm just going to click on. So what I'm going to do here is click on this top 100 button. So I'm going to limit it to the, the top 100 objects just to make it easy to, to talk to. So I don't have all 3,000 going. And so I've got the top 100 objects here. And this is the now. So I'm going to sort. So this this these colors here show you this is $2,100. So this will show you for the next six hours the altitude of that object. So this is 2,100, 2,300, and then one in the morning, three in the morning, my time. Um, so if I sort that column, from largest to smallest, it'll then show me out of those 100 objects, which right now are right over my head. So right now, if I went out there, you know, the Stevens Quartet, ARP 319 would be the best. Andromeda is pretty close. And what's what's cool about this is you can see how that altitude changes over the next six hours. So it may not be good now. Some of these may show, you know, like if I scroll down here a bit, some of these like the Rose Galaxy, or let's take, um, you know, this galaxy cluster, it's, it's bad now, 41, but if you wait a few hours, it'll be 80 degrees. And also, if you look over here, you can see we've got a smattering of blues and reds. So if I was imaging tonight, I would probably, um, you know, sort it here by, and, and look at the green ones, and then look at the ones like here with the 60s or 57s, you know, the ones that are far enough away because the moon's pretty full tonight that I could actually image this properly. So that's that's a snapshot of how to use that spreadsheet. But we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Okay. Okay. Gary, uh Tarek wants to know, uh all the way from um from the Emirates, he wants to know uh, if he can see uh, which of these catalogs he can see. Could you go back to your slide naming the catalogs and let's just say that that, that those first seven and which of them includes objects that he could see from the 25th uh parallel 20 latitude, latitude 25. 25 north he said well, 25 at, north yeah i'm at 31 north so he's pretty close to me so anything that i've done in the anything in the whole compendium pretty much in fact i would love to be at 25 because i can reach far north the problem i have is i can only get down to minus 50 south if i was where he was i could get down to almost minus 60 south so uh, basically everything in the compendium that you see pictured, all 1,800 objects you can image. Okay. And I know some of them, like the Caldwell objects do go pretty far south. Um, yeah. So we're going to talk about that here in a second. Okay. And then um, uh, Mike Elmico wants to know, um, do you keep all that stuff out the, uh, outside at night? <laughs> hey, Mike. Uh, so so that's part of i think he's just joking around here I, so that's part of the fun here is no i have to set it up and take it down every night and now that i've got the rasa 11 for those of you that know the size is rasa it's just a beast so i'm an old guy and uh it's it's getting harder and harder to set up and take down every night but no i've i've set up and take down every night and uh, I, I you know for some strange reason I, everybody's telling me to get an observatory but i, I just kind of enjoy it i it, it, in this i don't know i can't explain it <laughs> Okay. Thank you. And I okay. think I think we've covered everything that uh, people. Yeah, I think we got it. We we, we okay, haven't let's... we haven't uh, covered all the uh, thank you and I love this and you're wonderful and will you marry me and all that junk. But uh, we'll get on to the next. <laughs> That's great. No, nobody wants to marry a guy who's spending every night under the stars. I can promise you that. I'm 
My wife uh, gets, uh, she's an angel for sure. Okay. Okay. So, I, I got to tell you, I made the part up about will you marry me? I just made yeah, that up. Okay. Well, that's that's so. a good thing. That makes, that makes my heart feel better. Um, so we're going to talk now about the companion, which is the PDF file. And uh, I know you can't read it, but on the left side is all the bookmarks. And so the bookmarks are by far the easiest way to jump around in the document. And uh, I would encourage you to use that because it's just so easy that way. So I will take you here to the table of contents. So this is a table of contents. I've got some introductory chapters. I'll take you to the top 100. And then these are all the catalogs. So if you click on these, you'll see all the catalogs. And then here's all the start of all the collections. Um, so I, you know, there's over 100 of, of all of these things. And what I'm going to do to start with here is I'm going to take you to the top 100. So I'm going to click on that link. And, and what you'll see here is uh, the reason I want to show this to you is typical of all of the different sections. So in each section, I start with text. So I have anywhere from one to nine pages of text that describe the catalog, describe the targets, and provide some historical context. Like in this case, I'm, I'm telling you, how did I pick these top 100? What were my criteria? And then like on the second page, I talk about the targets that didn't quite make the list that were close, which has created some controversy when I posted this on, on Askerman. And then um, it takes you to the targets. And so this is, uh, you know, my favorite targets, M16. And the reason I wanted to show this is if I zoom in, right now I'm at plus 150. So let's say I go to plus, you know, 300. Um, I had to downsize these, obviously, to fit everything. 2,000 images in one PDF file that was manageable. So I tried to downsize it, but, you know, the resolution is still okay. This isn't something that you're going to put on your wall. Uh, but I think it, the resolution is good enough that it gives you a feel, as I, as I scroll down here, it gives you a feel for what these objects look like and what to expect when you image these objects as well. So this is the top 100 list. And you can see the primary ne primarily nebula. And I'll show you more on this when we get into the spreadsheet uh, later. But this is typical of the format in that I start with text and then I show you all of the images and then now I have the spreadsheet, but this isn't the spreadsheet. This is just in the PDF file. These are, um, for convenience, just a description of each object. I have an it's an abbreviated description. So all I have here is the nickname, what it is, the size, the location, the constellation, and then the, the day that it transits at midnight. And then if you click, for example, on M16, it'll take you right to my Astrid page for M16. And that's where I have a lot more detailed information and the high resolution pictures. So if I go back here, I, I only have for this is the top 100. So you'll see, well, I actually have 200 in here because I put 100 images. I ended up throwing in my top 200 uh, objects. You'll actually see those in the spreadsheet. And then these are the locations. And uh, so the locations I have for many of these, and uh, it's it may be hard to read, but the bottom is right ascension. And what you'll see here is the date. So like today, it's it's close to uh, November 21st. This is the 21st of November. So right now, these are the objects that are going to be uh, over our head. And what this screen shows, this is declination. Uh, I live at, at, at 30, and we heard Tarek lives, you know, 25. But this shows you the location in the sky for each of these top 100 objects. And then the, the blue here is the Milky Way, how that goes through the sky. And you'll see that uh, these objects are, are located both in the Milky Way and outside the Milky Way. Now, this is opposed to the Messier catalog. If I show you the, the Messier catalog here, so these are my Messier entries, which most of you are, are familiar with the Messier catalog. But if I show you the locations on this catalog, I've gotten color coded. And for those of you that haven't seen this, probably many of you already have, but I find it interesting because what you see is like, for example, red are the galaxies. And when you think about it, you know, it makes sense. You can only see the galaxies in the area where the Milky Way is not. And so the red dots show up uh, on the area outside of the blue Milky Way. And obviously it's, it's the exact opposite for Milky Way objects. So stars in the Milky Way show up primarily in the Milky Way itself, same in nebula, same as the nebula. There's a few exceptions. You know, you'll see a few star related clusters kind of out in the middle of nowhere, nowhere here where you're looking not into the Milky Way, but but out uh, and uh, in terms of out, out of the, the, the thin part, if you want to think of it that way. So these are probably closer to us. Uh, but generally, that, that map shows you in the sky about where they are. Um, it's just another visual context to help give you a, a clue. I want to show you, we talked about Caldwell, so I do want to show you those because you may not be familiar with Caldwell. I personally think the Caldwell catalog is just as good as the Messier for, for imaging. 
And so these are some of the Caldwell objects, which you're you're probably familiar with. We got the Iris Nebula, the the cave, the uh, cave nebula, the wall, a bubble nebula. I see some interesting galaxies here. Of course, we got the crescent, uh, the flaming star. We've got some of this, the Cygnus loop here, um, obviously Rosette Nebula. So some really interesting stuff in the Caldwell, of course, the antenna galaxies, the Helix Nebula, the butterfly. So don't uh, overlook the, the Caldwell catalog. And that, you know, I do find that to be, to be an interesting one. Now, if I bring back my talk, which I just talked to you about, I showed you this slide, which showed you the progression from Messier to Caldwell to then Hidden Treasures and Secret Deep, which are the ones that Omera put together, and then the two. So I'm going to show you these four very quickly, just to give you a feel for what those catalogs look like. So this is Hidden Treasures. This is the first one that Omira put together. And these, again, this was primarily a visual catalog. And there are some interesting objects here. Um, a smattering of, of nebula that are that you will recognize, um, you know, from uh, our, the Orion area, for example, Christmas tree, um, just just a lot of different ones, um, and and some objects, some galaxies that I think are fun to image. So that's hidden treasures, and then secret deep is similar. It, it has similar objects, which again, these are primarily visual objects. Uh, some of them are tough to see visually, actually, uh, like Thor's helmet, but. Um, this will show you that, that complete list. And so I've imaged all of these, except for if I go back to Caldwell now, what you'll notice about the Caldwell objects, which um, some of you may know, when Sir Patrick Moore put this together, he was very sensitive to the fact that, that uh, Messier did all of his imaging from the Paris or, or somewhere in that area. And so some of the Southern objects were ignored. So this is a sky map. I mean, let me, I showed you the sky map for Messier. This is the sky map for Caldwell. So you can see he's included some really interesting objects. Well, you can't see because I haven't put them on my chart. Uh, I, this chart only includes the one I've imaged. So it only goes down to, to minus 50. But you can see the numbers go up to 83. So there is from, from the object 84 to 109 are the Caldwell objects that are south of minus 150. So those don't, don't show up here. Um, but I do want to go then to the catalogs that I put together. One is called the Orphan Beauties, and this is the list that uh, haven't been included in those first four. So these are some nebula that uh, that were not identified uh, in those first 430 or so uh, objects. And these are some that you'll recognize immediately. Phantom of the Opera Nebula, you see IC59, uh, Fish Head, which I don't know why I call it the Fish Head. It looks like a whole fish to me. Soul Nebula, Heart Nebula, California Nebula. Um, Eagle's head there, uh, tadpoles, uh, witch's head, if you turn your head to the side, spaghetti, um, the seagull nebula, um, you can see the jellyfish nebula, um, the gourd. So, you know, in my opinion, and Jones Emerson, these are some of the most interesting objects in the sky to image and, and some of the most interesting galaxies. But they weren't included in those others because those were primarily visual uh, focuses. So if you're looking for something and you're done with Messier, you can attempt something like the Caldwell, or you can just attempt these here because you know I do think there's some like the Cygnus Loop, Pelican. Uh, there's just some really interesting stuff out there. The the uh, the squid, and the flying bat, uh, lobster, uh, and one of my favorites, the lion. So there's just a lot of good stuff out there. Those are orphan beauty. So those are the the bigger, fainter nebula that I've captured in one catalog. And then finally, small packages is this one here where. You really need a bigger scope to try to capture some of these things. And I've tried to categorize them in different ways. So for example, the first 11 are familiar shapes. So you can see the heron, the penguin and egg, Darth Vader, tadpole, the rose, the grasshopper, the umbrella. These are all kind of famous objects, atoms for peace, the mice. And then I've got different categories like duos, but these are all small objects. That's why I call it small packages. And these were obviously none of these were included in the previous catalogs. Uh, this is one of my favorite category called star streams. Some of these star streams are close to a million, uh, billion light years. Some planetary nebula that were ignored in the previous ones and uh, rings, I love rings and so on. So that tells you kind of what those catalogs are. So those are a snapshot of the catalogs. I do want to show you one more thing and that's the Abel planetary nebula catalog. Because if you're looking to image some planetary nebula, Abel is uh, the place to go because there's some really fascinating uh, bright ones to image here. And, uh, you know, it gives you 85, 86 to choose from. You want to stay away, at least at first, from the ones like 23, which kind of hardly show up. So if they hardly show up on mine, like 7 to 23, it's going to be tough 
to get them to to show up but if you see some of these brighter ones they're they're kind of easy and some of them are up to you know three or four arc minutes so if you have a a thousand meter focal length scope you can give that a try so those are the catalogs and now i want to dive really quickly before i take a few more questions into the galaxy collections so i mentioned the grand design spiral so these these collections now we're not in the catalogs anymore these are just simple collections that i i uh, put together based on my um experience there's nothing official about these these are just things that i did so uh these are the grand spirals grand spiral galaxies are some of my favorites and what i think is really cool about grand spiral galaxies is that they're point symmetric and so that means if you take the like this i did here if you take the object and you rotate it 180 degrees and put it next to the same object it's shocking to me how well those two compare um and so i mean obviously some of the objects aren't going to compare exactly because for example m51 you've got the companion which is going to flip flop when you flip it but if you look at some of these galaxies and and the symmetry that you see between the two flipped images i think it's just amazing in nature how how these grand spirals develop in such a symmetric way some of them you can hardly even tell uh, the difference between the two and so i just find that fascinating about grand spirals uh flocculent galaxies uh number of people have had questions to me over the years about what what is what is a flocculent galaxy it's easy it's just to look at a flock if you look at a flocculent galaxy and, and that's what's nice about putting all of these on the same page it's easy to tell what a flocculent galaxy is flocculent means wool like a sheep's wool and that's kind of what it looks like you don't have the distinct spiral arms you can see some aspects of the arms in these but for by and large they're they're kind of loose arrangements and it's a specific galaxy type uh, that that I think is a beautiful galaxy and it makes for a nice galaxy to image. Super thin, uh, I tried to go into the uh, the archives and pull out from papers and stuff, a list of super thin galaxies and I couldn't find it done consistently because it all depends on how good your image is. If you're trying to do it visually, it's hard to, some people have tried to do it visually, but you know, imaging, I was able to take all my images and kind of make them the same darkness because the key here is how wide are the galaxies don't have distinct start and stop points where they start and stop on the edges. So I tried to be consistent with how I, I came up with them. And these are all ranked according to the aspect ratio, length versus over width. And you can see UGC 9242, which is 18, 18 times longer than is wide, was the uh, the winner, <laughs> if you want to call it. But again, these all make for, in my opinion, these all make for fun galaxies uh, to image. These are the Magellanic galaxies, which are dwarf galaxies. And again, it's fun to put them all on the same page because you can see, it's hard to describe a Magellanic galaxy, but when you see it, you can see it has very common characteristics, an off-center white bar, uh, blue star formation areas. They're all small in size. They usually have one dominant arm. So it's amazing out there in the universe how consistent these Magellanic galaxies are. I'm going to take you now uh, to something I'll call hexagons, because this is where the galaxies actually, if you look at the galaxies and don't pay much attention, it's hard to notice. But if you look carefully, and I tried to outline them here in yellow, you can see that some galaxies actually take on a distinct hexagon shape, either in their inner ring, inner bright ring, or in the outer. And uh, these are are the the, the first. Uh, these all these galaxies also have VV rows, and I'll talk about those here in just a minute as well. Uh, but some of these uh, take actually take on the shape of hexagons, which in nature, like we see with Saturn and other places, beehives uh, is, is a pretty common shape. I'm going to jump along down here. I'm not going to show you all these, but bar lenses, I think, is pretty cool. Uh, bar lens is a very distinct feature of a core that looks like a bar overlaid by a lens. That's why they call it a bar lens. And what it is, actually, if you look at the edge on view of, like, for example, NGC 4665, um, if I can make that a little bigger here. If you look at the edge on view, these are all these peanut shape or X shaped cores. where It's due to the orbital pass of the stars in the bar. And from the side, it's actually easy to identify because it's an X shape. And I have a separate, I don't have a collection here. I, I, on Astrobin, I have an X shape. But from the top, it's even more interesting to me because instead of an X, you actually have this distinct bar shape, which is, um, you know, as you can see with many of these, some more distinct than others, a, a long bar with a, a very wide core. And so it's not a bar galaxy. It's not a simple core galaxy. It's a combination, which is called the bar lens. These are the VV rows, which I had mentioned uh, some galaxies, and these are some of the same ones that I put in the hexagon. But here's where I identify some of those VV rows. So, so VV rows, for those of you that aren't familiar, are named uh, for the scientists who studied them 60 years ago, Dr. Boris Berensov, 
Vlayaminov, and I'm sure I'm not pronouncing that right. For the longest time, I thought these were two separate scientists, but no, it was one. And he had the vision of being able to study these straight segments of galaxies, which I find fascinating. And also I find fascinating, we don't completely understand them today even. So these are these straight segments, which I've tried to outline here and they're fun to image. So, you know, if you get a chance to take a picture of one of these and examine those, I, I just find that to be, to be fascinating. Uh, collisional rings are another interesting subset. And for this one, you do need a, a stronger scope. But these are galaxies, which uh, I really couldn't believe when I first saw them, how they were formed. So basically, a galaxy has been hit by another smaller galaxy along its polar axis. And that collision has created a hole. So for each of these objects, you can see a galaxy that has a hole in it. And then you can see nearby, you can see the companion, which has hit it many times not not for every one of these but you can usually see both the hole and the culprit who's hit them and again if you have a strong scope uh to me these are fascinating objects to image i did want to before i concluded this section i did want to mention um, the merger section that i have here so this is uh looking at how mergers happen in galaxies so for example what this shows you these are the different merger classifications this paper was published about 10 years ago and it goes from M1 to actually M5. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit here. And you can see M1 is where there's, there's no bridge between the galaxies, but the data shows there's a connection between them. They're the same distance. Forming a long bridge, galaxies get closer, form the short bridge. You have two close cores, which are almost indistinguishable. Then you have only one core with tails. And then you have finally a merged core with no tails. And so in my mind, this is just you know, in the universe, we don't have the luxury of seeing from start to finish how things happen, but we do see a snapshot in time of thousands of different objects. So this shows you how galaxies merge. And what's interesting about this is I think this is how galaxies merge from left to right. Uh, Dr. Arp, who knew a whole lot more about galaxies than I did, would say the same diagram shows how, 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 how galaxies split apart from right to left, because he believed that galaxies started off as one and split. So we had a difference there, uh, but but it's fun. It's fun just to image them, and it's fun to look at them. So this gives you some some objects there. Before I conclude, just want to show you uh, a few more here. Uh, one is um, a planetary nebula. Uh, there's a section here called morphology. So I'm trying to show here because planetary nebula are fascinating, but they're simply a function many times of how we're looking at them. So they form. Many scientists think they form in a very familiar way, which is shown here, assuming you have a uh, a binary uh, progenitor star at the center. This would be the way it formed. And our view of it depends on how we look at that torus and how we look at the lobes. Now, these other up here show what happened if we have a central star that does not have a binary star or just a single progenitor. Well, that's for the right-hand side, the spherical. The elliptical does have a, a binary uh, within a small envelope. But that just gives you a feel for different planetary nebula, trying to not only have objects to image, but it's fun to sometimes just take a step back and try to learn more about how these objects came to be. And scientists are still learning, but what's cool with the tools we have is we can take part in that learning process and we can use our tools in our backyards to try to understand this more and try to see what's actually happening. We've had some discussions on Astrobin recently about ANSIA uh, for planetary nebula. And these are the red jets, these are bipolar jets that are coming out of each axis north and south of these these planetary nebula and scientists are actively just like with other things we've talked about here actively trying to understand these ansia which are typically hydrogen and how how they're progressing um so i think with that i'm, I'm just going to close with a, a star type object here i'm going to close the book part i'm going to get into the spreadsheet here in a minute but this is what i call young stellar objects i don't call it that that's what i called it in the spreadsheet uh, some of these objects you may recognize, like Hubble's Variable Nebula or the keyhole here, but most of them are, are not that well imaged. And if you have a, a strong scope, the fun thing about these is that they change. They can change year to year. And so if you take a picture of it now and then another one in five years, because these are stars that are newly forming and their lights are bouncing off the dust that's moving around these systems, you'll see changes. And I've already seen, I, I wish I would have had that here. This one here, PV SEP, where you see the single arc coming out. I have other images which show two arcs coming out. So it's 
space is thought of as, as maybe something that we don't, we can't see changes in time scales because things are so massive and so big. And that's true 90% of the time, 99% of the time. But sometimes we can see how things are, are evolving and changing. I, I find that to be very exciting. So with that, Eric, I'm going to take a break before I talk about the spreadsheet. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions here about, about any of this. Well, I have a comment and there's a question here. And I think that Alex probably has another one. You had the orphan objects. Yeah. But in the orphan objects, I would guess that's 80% of the things that most astrophotographers image. You're right. And my point, my only point in including them in a catalog is that I was shocked when I first leaned into this and I didn't see it, any of these in the Messier, in the Caldwell, uh, so, or in the work that Stephen James O'Meara did on his two catalogs. And, and people were thinking that those first four catalogs, that, that was you know, it. But it, it helps to keep in mind that those first four catalogs were visual based. And what we consider to be our bread and butter, some of these like the Soul Nebula and Heart, you would never look at the, well, I shouldn't say never, but I think those would be very challenging objects to look at visually. But for us, we live in a very nice, uh, I feel very blessed to be at the time we live in because we have the equipment, we have the ability to look at these beautiful objects. We don't look, I love looking through the eyepiece at star clusters, globular clusters and open clusters, but you can't do that as well with Nebula. And so my point in putting those beauties together is just to have a single place where we have all of these nice nebula. Uh, if, so if a beginner is saying, hey, what can I image besides Messier? That's something to take a look at. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a question here from Brandon. Hey, Brandon. With with uh, your new RASET, do you uh, intend to add more of the dark nebula or L LDNs or LDNs? Oh, man, yeah. that's. I, I, I know they're more that. challenging you know, from any kind of light pollution at all, but. Uh... Yeah, no, I love, I love, I love that. I mean, that's one of my favorite things to image, so for sure. Um, and the real question here is, uh, I'm, I'm definitely gonna do that as long as I'm alive, I'm gonna use that Rasa and I'm gonna just use the heck out of it. But, um, you know, the question is what do I do with the compendium? Because uh, I've already got a hundred objects image I haven't included and I'm gonna get more. So, you know, my intent here is to kind of keep updating it and have a section, for example, on those big dark nebula. And, and like I said, having one called Faint Wonders, which includes a lot of that. But whether or not I go through the work of that, because it is a lot of work, just, I mean, it doesn't seem like it would be, but just getting these spreadsheets and, and putting all this in a PDF file is just a lot of work. And so whether it's worth to do that, I just have to wait and see how, how um, you know, how much people use it. And if it takes on a bit of a life, then I think it would be fun to put those new objects in here in one of the next revisions. But we'll just have to see how it progresses. Well, the, the LBNs and the LDNs, I mean, they're not for the rest of them. A good many of them are, are wide field targets. Yeah, and so I've got a fair amount of space. Is, yeah, I know, saw them at the end there where you have Yeah, them. so you've got L LBNs here, and then these are the dark nebula. But, you know, to be honest, um, these are, you know, pretty crappy uh, images because I'm doing them with a, I'm doing all of these with a slow system. Now, some of them, you know, like the Phantom of the Opera and the Lion or, or NCC uh, uh, 1333. I can get a, because some people call it embryo nebula, I guess, but I can get decent images of that. But some of these other ones, uh, getting to Brandon's uh, question there, um, the, the beauty really comes out when you can get a fast system on them and, and start really taking some good images. You know, I actually, when I used to partake in it, I won the uh, Astrobin image of the day for this one here, which I like to call, I think I don't like to call it, it's, it's a Loch Ness nebula. But if I had a much deeper, faster image of that, it would just be so much better. So that's what I'm looking forward to is using that Rasa scope to redo a lot of what I'm showing here in the LDN, but then also imaging a lot of other ones that are even more faint. Um, Alex? Tam, Tam wants to know, what's the furthest DSO you've ever captured? Yeah, so um, that would be the, uh, the Cheshire cat. And so um, if I bring up my spreadsheet, and, uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not gonna bring it up because, uh, but, but I'm just gonna answer the question instead of bring, cause I, I don't wanna run out of time. But so basically that is where uh, you actually see these gravitational lensing of distant clusters. So all you see are arcs of these much more distant galaxies there. So I'm, I'm actually taking a picture of a cluster that's about 4 billion light years away, but the, cluster is lensing a galaxy that I, I recall is something like 10 billion. But of course, when it gets that far away, you get the distances are, 
are all relative and it's hard to estimate, but it's just a long, long ways away. So that the, the, the Cheshire cat uh, gravitational lensing is the, the furthest I've, I've imaged. Um, but that's a bit ridiculous. I would say, you know, most often, most of the stuff I'm imaging lately are between 100 and, and a half billion light years. You can get good detail up to a half billion. Um, when you get up to over a billion, it starts to get hard. Things get small and it's just hard to see the detail. So the only time I really go much more than a billion is if it's a cluster. What about uh, Nova? Do you ever you have a catalog or collection of Nova that you might put up? Yeah, I've got a section on on uh, Nova, um, and I've got some listed. I think if I go into the spreadsheet, but I don't have many, you know. So if I if I click, so the the way I'll, I'll get into this in a minute. But the way to sort these things, it, you, you, I'm, this print may be too small, but I'm going to take select all off, and I'm just going to click on Nova. So I think just a few will show up here. Ah, only. Well, I've got I've got to take up got to take off this filter first, and now I can sort under Nova. So I only have three. I've got this really cool one called. So this is a cool one called, and and this is actually my top one hundred list called our Aquari, and I really like this one. This is a a picture that compares that object with the Hubble uh, image. So that is a Nova, and then I've got two other ones here, but there's plenty of other ones out there. They're just hard to image. You know, these Novas are very faint for the most part and, and hard to, I mean, you see they're small, you know, like one and a half. And and they come and they go, right? Yeah, they come and they go for sure, yeah. Although I think, you know, in our time scale, they, they uh, you know, it, 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 these are actual Nova. Now, Supernova are much brighter and I've imaged several of those and, uh, and they stick around for a few months and they're, so they're gone quickly, so. But these here are actually Nova, which are, are fainter, and uh, but they do they're they're longer scale than supernova. Though. Okay, I think we're finished with the questions, as far as I can tell. Okay, well let me dive in. I've only got a few minutes, uh, you know, ten or fifteen minutes left here, so I'm going to talk specifically about the spreadsheet. That's all really I have left to talk about. So assuming you can see this here, uh, I've already talked about this a little bit, but I'm going to go through each section very quickly. So the first one here are these filters. Uh, clicking on this button here, which is show all objects, brings everything back. But sometimes I like to go just to the top 100 or top 200. It just makes it easier to sort, easier to find things. So this will, this will, this top 635 that sorts those six catalogs that I just mentioned to you, including the Orphan Beauties and so on. Those are, if I was going to pick the top 600 objects, that would be it. So that's uh, buttons to filter things on. This here is all the time section. And, well, this is basically the user input. Latin lawn for users, uh, what your offset is from Greenwich Mean Time, whether you have daylight saving times going on or not, and then the actual time. Now you can put the time directly in here, but I also have this now button, which will bring it up to the time right now, or 6 p.m. because oftentimes it's in the morning. I want to see what's going on at night. And then these spin buttons will let you advance it or a uh, day or a month or a year if you want to look to the future. So that's where you put your data in. The moon data, and this is not showing up here because I've got it zoomed in so much. If I zoomed out a little bit, it'll show you. Uh, so the moon will show you the icon of what the current status is of the moon for the time that you have in here, the rise of the moon and the set of the moon. And this is really important, obviously, for imaging. And then the age and the illumination percentage for that time. Same with the sun. So depending on the time of day and so on, it'll show you the time of sunrise and sunset. And then I always like to start and stop my imaging at the nautical time. So I've got the nautical times in here. Um, so that top row doesn't change, that's just kind of fixed. And then the bottom here, I'll start to start talking about the objects. So the first column, as you can see here, these are all the different objects. And if I put my mouse over it, hopefully you can see that, you know, like that's the Andromeda galaxy. This is the Egg Nebula, Wizard Nebula. So the mouse over images here are not high resolution. I had to really tweak these because I've got 2,000 of them in the spreadsheet. And so it, 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 I wanted it to be quick, and I didn't want the spreadsheet to be too large. Large, But the advantage is you, if you want to know what this looks like, G100 point, which, by the way, is really a cool object. Um, it's this one here. I'm going to click on it. If I click on it, it brings up the Astrobin version. So this shows you what... The object, if I click on that, it shows you, um, you know, eventually a full resolution view of it. So this is a cool uh, object that that is not very well known that's out there. Um, so if I take you back, so I, I've covered a few things here. One is that you can mouse over this 
and see what the images are. Two, if you click on them, it takes you right to Astrobin. The next column shows a nickname, and then it shows you the type. And what I wanted to talk to you here for a few minutes is this drop-down arrow. So each column has a drop-down arrow. And for those of you familiar with Excel, you'll probably know this already. But if you click on that drop-down arrow, it gives you all different options for sorting. And please use these options because they're really powerful options. The first part is a sorting mechanism. So if you want to sort by name, so that's pretty often, you know, I want to sort by object name, for example. Um, and you can see it takes about three seconds for things to sort because there's a lot of data in the spreadsheet. Or if you sort by right ascension, which is pretty common when you're trying to look uh, for objects. So the drop down arrow uh, allows you to sort uh, smallest to largest, largest to smallest. Depends what the, what the parameter is you want to sort. Now, sorting keeps all of the data in there. So in this case, we've got 3,000 objects. Sorting just sorts those 3,000 objects in a different order. That's different than filtering. Filtering is the next section. So for example, um, if I was going to just take a look at what I wanted to see tonight, first I would sort this top 100 column over here for the top. Well, probably what I would do first is filter the top 100, because that would be easiest. And then I might, I might sort from largest to smallest to largest, so I have the objects sorted. But the next thing I might do is sort according to altitude. So the sort here is, let's say, largest to smallest. So though right now, at this time of day, this is telling me which object is highest in the sky and in theory, you know, best to image. Although when I'm in imaging, I might take an object that might be a couple hours out because if I want to take two or three hours of an image, which you typically can do for these uh, higher altitude objects, you don't want to start it when it's right overhead. You want to start it before it gets to meridian and then continue to do that. So that's the sorting. What you might want to do, for example, in one night, you might want to say, well, I've got a wide focal length scope, so I don't want to image small objects. So you just go down here to the filter and you can do like number filter. And you can say, I just want to look at objects that are greater than, you know, 40 arc minutes, for example, and just click yes. Well, right now it took all of the ones that are less than 40 out of this list. And then you can also go over here, for example, if you just were wanted to image galaxies, unselect this box and select galaxies and say, okay. And it's only going to show a couple because I've, already, I've got the list sorted for anything greater uh, than that that size. If I take that greater than filter and make it a bit smaller, it'll give me some more choices. So in galaxies, maybe I want to do everything greater than eight arc minutes. So you can see here tonight, uh, I don't have a lot of choices. I've got, if I want to do galaxies tonight, I've got Andromeda and I've got uh, this uh, and NC660. Uh, so I've got this one and I've got that one. And so those sorts are very powerful and you can use them in many different ways to either sort, filter, or just pick the ones you want. Um, and so that's what I did here. Right? I just picked the galaxies that I want. So I'm going to clear all that right now and just get back to what I had before. This is right ascension and I show both hour, minute, second, and degrees, declination, hour, uh, degree, minute, second, and degrees, and then constellation. If I hold my mouse over constellation, it shows you what constellation it's in, in pink. And um, you can see here, for example, in Cassiopeia. So that's just another visual aid to help you. These two columns here are for you to use. And what they are, if I get back to my top 100 sort, I think you'll see this here, um, or maybe not. I'll just do it on the fly. So if you want an object that's high priority, you just put H here. And all that does is it put it in green. Because you know, a lot of times I go through this ahead of time and, uh, and just pick a, a couple objects I want to use that night. So anything you put an H in will be in green. Anything you put an L in, which is low priority, it won't, it won't blank it out, but it'll show it in a font that's a little dimmer. So I'm trying to make that easier for you to say, hey, these are the objects I want to image. These are the ones I don't want to image. And then once you've imaged an object, just put a yes in this column and, and then, yeah. And assuming the priority is not there anymore, then it takes it out and makes it gray. So if you've imaged this one, you just put a Y there, and then you know you don't have to worry about it anymore. These I've already talked to you about. These are the altitude of the object over the next six hours. So whatever the now time is, which here is 2137, that'll be the first column here, 2100, 2300, and then one and three. So these are the next six hours of time and how the altitude progresses over those times. At one time, I had all 24 hours in here, but the calculations got too intense. The sun elevation, now if I back this up towards sunset, um, you can see what happens. So this is just showing you, is the sun out or not? And in fact, you know, if, if, I advance, if I advance the minutes here a little bit, what you'll see is that yellow color becomes a gray. So in twilight, I'm, I'm not picking it right, but in that time between uh, sunset and astronomical time, it'll be gray. So there'll be 
this top bar here for the next six hours will be black, which means it's completely dark, yellow, it sun's up, or gray, which means it's in between. The transit time is important. So this time here is, tells you exactly when it reaches um, when it reaches its peak overhead. So for example, you can see this one here goes, it, it's reached its peak. It looks like it reaches peak at 2100. It actually reaches it at 2230. So that's the time it reaches transit. And then the date, that is when the transit is exactly at midnight. So if you're looking for the time when that object will be in the sky, the longest part of the night uh, of the day of the year, this would be the day to image that object. And then we've talked about this a little bit already. This is the separation from the moon. And this is the index, which shows you basically how, how, how easy, how, how much light from that moon is, is causing a problem. The blue ones, indexes closer to 100 are going to be a, a good place to image. And images closer, indexes closer to zero are going to be uh, too close to image for broadband. If you, like I said, if you have narrowband filters, you can start to cheat on that. And then before I stop here, I just wanted to show you, if you scan right, so this is showing you for each object, you know, keep in mind, you know, we're looking at an object across the row here. I, I, I probably could freeze this and then you could see what objects uh, these are. I'm just gonna freeze this here. And then, um, then I can scroll right and you'll see. So for example, the top line now is the Eagle Nebula. I'm gonna pretend like I haven't, pretend like I haven't imaged it yet. So I'm gonna delete these. If I just go across on this Eagle Nebula, you know, it shows you um, its Messier number. It's actually got an IC number. And then it's actually got a GUM number and an LBN number and an SH2 number. So these are all the different uh, catalogs. So for example, you wanted to look at all the Sharpless uh, objects, you just sort by that. And the advantage to this column here is, you know, people think, well, why don't I just use the object name Many of these, you can see over here in the left column, many of them do have Sharpless number as the name. But a lot of them, even though they're Sharpless objects, they have other names. And that's the advantage of having the catalog separate is because you can see that, so then the number that I'm mousing over here, this 313, that number in that row here, that last row shows you how many objects are in the spreadsheet. So there's 313 Sharpless objects. And my point in this is that all 313 will show up in this column, but over here, you'll see the NGC numbers and other things. So the, the object name is the more common name, and sometimes that's not the sharpest number. Now, if I scroll right, you can see we go from the catalogs, and then we get into these collections that I talked about. So let's so say, for example, these hexagons. If you click on any hyperlink, it'll take you to my Astrobin poster that has the the uh, hexagons, and you know, this is where I have have a mouse over. So when you mouse over, you can see where those hexagons are. But getting back to the spreadsheet, if you want to image those, you just sort by that column, and then it'll show you all of these galaxies, and you can look at them, decide you know what's up. This will show you what's up right now. So right now, there's you know only a few of them that are in a good position to image. And then uh, takes you the same thing for planetary nebula, different collections, star collections. And then the last few columns here, I'm not sure if this will be useful for people, but this shows you uh, for the image I took, which is the mouse over, what filters did I use? I always use RGB, so I didn't bother to put that here. And you know, by the way, you know, these all have comments to tell you, you know, what is a protoplanetary nebula? What's a Herbig Harrow? So I, I did try to explain that here. But so these will tell you the filters be besides RGB that I use the image, which is, is, is important, especially for some of the sharpless stuff, because, and the reason for that is if you filter, if I filter this by the sharpless collection, for example, <clears throat> you'll see over here that some of them are SHO, some of them are just LGB, some of them are just hydrogen. So it just depends. Some of them don't have enough S and O to actually image. And it's nice to know that ahead of time. I also have the focal lengths, the pixel scale, the field, field radius. And this last column is just a filtering column. Before I close uh, with my presentation, I just want to say, be careful. I've made, I I've, I've, I've haven't frozen this spreadsheet. You can do whatever you want with it. But be careful because if you start inserting rows and columns in here, like I've done thousands of times in developing this thing, it'll cause these mouse over images to not be square anymore. And that sounds like a trivial thing, but if you do a lot of that, they become uh, rectangular to the point you can't even see the image. So I would encourage you, if you're going to add anything to these rows and columns, and that has to do with how Microsoft in Excel puts those coordinates in for those mouse overs. There's nothing you can do about that. 
But what you can do, if you're going to insert a row or column, do it at the end. So do it at the very, like in, inside the last row of the street sheet or the last column, and that'll minimize the distortion that you get on those mouse over images over time. And if you're really in a bind, just you know, contact me because I've got some macros that can bring the, all of those images back to square um, because that's how they start out. So I wanted them to be square because it, you want to know what the aspect ratio is you know, for each of those. So with that, I'm going to stop. I know I'm right at the end of my time. Um, and so I'm um, happy to answer any more questions that may be out there. Well, that was great, Gary. Uh... It's, Thank you. It kind of gives me a headache thinking of how much time and effort that you put into this. I mean, it's, <laughs> I'm sure you're not counting the hours, but I I do remember reading something about after 50,000 hours, if you're Japanese, you you finally become the expert. It sounds like you've kind of gotten there. Well, they say I, ten, yeah, I don't know. I don't know. Gary. Well, how did you get the information in there? Where did you get the information from and how was it entered? In the spreadsheet? Yeah. Well, you know, it was um, a lot of it was just entered by hand. I, I, I don't have any trusty assistants here. So yeah, it was. <laughs> no, but that's what I mean. You, well, for instance, the object visibility that I'm looking at right now, that's calculated somehow, right? Oh yeah, so that's a great point. So I was able to build off of, and I do show that, let me show that here. Um, that's a good point. So um, what I show here is, um, well, it, I can't find it now. Oh yeah, right here, acknowledgements. Acknowledgements that Keith Burnett, Simon Dawes, Gene Mias. So all of these folks have either written books or published uh, website articles that have uh, these uh, macros for calculating all of these different equations. So I use that as the basis of mine. Uh, there's nothing you can kind of take off the shelf and plug in. So it still took, the, that was probably the longest part was trying to make all of, especially the moon calculations. I didn't realize how complicated it is to predict the moon, moon movements, but I did build off of what those folks had done. And there's actually, there's actually a great book, um, this one here, I don't know if you can see it. It's called Practical Astronomy with Your Calculator Spreadsheet by Peter Duffett Smith and Jonathan Zwart. So if any of you want to do anything like that, it's just all equations and stuff. That's, that's really useful. Okay, but for the bulk of it, like if you've got the Herschel 400, you had to either type in or copy paste the 400 names of the, uh, of the objects, the 400 RAs and decks and everything else. Yep, there's a lot of work. In fact, I had to learn how to do all this with my my left hand. I usually use the mouse with my right hand, but I was getting pretty severe carpal tunnel. The hardest part actually was all of the mouse overs. There's 2,000 mouse over images, and you've got to. So it's just it is a lot of work. It's just it it's just a lot, a lot of, of work. Tedious well, work. there's a lot of people commenting over there that you're you're quite the genius, but I think you're also a drudge. You, you just yeah, did a lot I, of drudge I don't think work. It's, it's not as much genius. It's just uh, a passion for something you love. If you love something, whether it's you know taking care of cats or painting, working for a church, um, you can pour yourself into it. And yeah, it might seem obsessive, and it probably is. The, the most amazing part of all this is that my wife is still with me. I think, I haven't checked, but I think so. I, I think all of us that do astrophotography are obsessive. Yeah, and, you uh, have to be. And, to and if you're not obsessive, you give up. <laughs> it's kind of, I found that way last night at 3 a.m. with my RASA trying to get it dialed in. I felt like giving up. Yeah. Well, I, so I a, assume uh, Eric, a question, a question popped up. Kajuma, okay, go ahead. Uh, asks, uh, "Hey Gary, do you never use luminance, only RGB, or do you make a synthetic luminance, or what do you do?" You know, I, when I first started this hobby five or six years ago, I dig dug deeply into a lot of the books, and and you know, I, I don't know how many of you. Um, you know, there's some great ones out there. You know, this is the one that I actually use so much I ripped apart the binder, but this is the Astrophotography Manual, uh, Manual by Chris Wooded. So there's all kinds of different theories out there. What I've done, I'm not saying it's the best thing to do, but I've always traditionally taken luminance. Um, and so I have a luminance and I usually image that. So when I say five hours on a typical object, it would be an hour each for RGB and then two hours for luminance. And um, I've just been really successful with that. 
model, but I know a lot of people don't take luminance and just come up with 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 uh, artificial luminance. But I, I I just enjoy taking the luminance, and it's more of a at this point, it's more of a just the way I do it. it I'm, I can't really justify that that's better, especially with the CMOS cameras and the sensitivities they have. I think there's going to be a day when I don't even have a mono camera anymore. I just have a color camera, and that's it. Okay. You know, uh, so I I take it your your target is to finish an image in one night. I mean, four or five hours. That sounds like a a decent e evening or do you try to get multiple targets and just get them at the highest altitude yeah i'm a i'm an obsessive planner and if you'd see my my cheat sheets on a given night you know um it's it's crazy and and going to windows remote desktop so now you know i set it up outside once i get it set up i can operate it from inside the house which has been a godsend because you know three in the morning it's not much fun to go outside and refocus and do everything but anyway um so um that slipped my mind what I was going to tell you about now. We were talking about. Uh, Do you try to finish an image? Oh, yeah. In the evening? So I, I always want to finish the RGB. And, and you really should do that because otherwise, what you find out if you stagger the R and the GB, you're combining those to get star shapes. I'm obsessive with getting good star shapes. And so if you have the same problem on a night, let's say it's windy, you know, if it's windy, you're not going to great, get great stars, but you can. Put those three together and then manage those three with different software tools to get them back to round. But if you have R one shape and G another shape, you can still, I've done that already and I've lived through that. I don't want to do that. So I try to get all the RGB on one night and depending if it's on high object, like for me, if it's between, let's say, you know, 10 degrees and 50 degrees, it'll be up long enough. I probably can get five uh, hours in one night. But most of the time, I just get RGB one night and loom the next. The other thing is, I always save my perfect nights for loom. I don't care if my RGB is not perfect, but if I get a perfect loom with the details on a calm night when it's clear, and so I almost always save my all of my loom for those really great scene nights. And I think that's the that's the best way to get detail, I think. You know, there's we just commented on luminosity versus selling RGB. In my experience, you get a better image with luminance and you get a different image using luminance and just summing RGB. And I'm not sure why that is, but if you want your best result, I think you really have to take luminance. Um, I've never, I, I'm, I'll tell you what, I'm a, I'm, I'm a, big, I'm a big fan of, of actually doing comparisons of, you know, is binning better, is drizzling better, is, you know, you see a lot of speculation, but it's not that hard to actually do it two different ways and compare. Mm -hmm. and, Six years ago, I did that with RGB. I did LRGB and I did RGB, and I just felt like taking the L for the same for the same amount of time. So if I took five hours of LRGB, I then split that five hours up just with RGB. So I had the same amount of time, and I felt like I did get a better image at that time. But I have a feeling with the higher efficiencies of camera these days, that may change. I'd like to do another comparison. Again. Somebody asked how many hours that you think you put into this. <laughs> <laughs> Wow. Yeah. How, how do you even count that? Because I'm, I don't know. I mean, so I, if I don't count the images, so the images themselves were, I mean, 10,000 hours of imaging time plus at least that much in processing. So 20,000 hours. But, you know, the compendium, since I already had the images and I did a lot of the work, um, it took me, you know, two or three months to assemble it all, work in, you know, 10 hour days. Um, it's all I do now. I don't have to work. So this is my work. It's kind of fun. But uh, I, I couldn't. I don't even want to answer that uh, because if you look at the total amount of time, you'd say, "Why would anybody spend that amount of time?" I could could have saved the world with that, you know. But it's. A, I just love my hobby. <laughs> okay, I think we're we've got a lot of stuff over there in the in the chat area. Comments from the YouTube. We've talked a little bit about it. We want to express. Um, up. Oh, what did Justin have to say? Was another one uh, on this one. Based on the separation data, does Gary notice a degree separation and index that favors his setup right now? Is there a threshold he mm -hmm. typically won't pass? What are? Uh, let's ask that another way. You know, your um, uh, red uh, that column we talked about earlier. What are what are your acceptable percentages or distances from the moon? And brightness is how do you determine that? 
Yeah, I think, um, you know, for it depends on the image. For narrow band, uh, I'll push the limits, but let's just say for RGB, uh, and RGB and L is there, I won't take any, if, if there's a moon that's more than about 60 or 70% full, I will not take any loom because in my experience, I have a hard time getting my flats to calibrate out, especially with dust and stuff like that. If there's too much background moonlight, the flat, the, the calibration just doesn't work well. It's not that the image is that bad, it's the calibration. So for looms, I would say once it reaches about 60% moon, I'm kind of done there. If, if I can get, if it was a half a moon and I can get looms, you know, 60 degrees away, I'm okay. With RGB, I can go up to about 30 degrees with a half moon. But once the moon gets more than half, I have to get probably 70 or 80 degrees away. And so that's why the index is hard because if I was gonna do it right, you'd actually have three different indexes. You'd have one for narrow band, one for loom, one for RGB, but even for narrow band, like we talked about, you, you'd have different ones for H2 and, and O3. So so it's just a rough guide. It's just a rough guide. And, and somebody else might come in with slightly different standards. Oh, and, of course, yeah. So yeah. just to answer a question about you know, how did I come up with these colors and indexes? It, it was some thought, obviously, but it was just my own my own logic. And, uh, I, you know, it's, it's, it's it, it, somebody could do a better job, I'm sure, with that. Okay, Tam, Tam wants to know what your next target is. And Ray says he's probably run out of targets. But anyway, what is your next target? <laughs> No, I mean, so the way the world works, I mean, if I just, I don't know if you can see this or not, and, you know, we're, we're getting, well, you're, you're sharing your screen. So we're yeah, still so on the, on we're, the getting, uh, we're getting to a place. So um, I don't know if you can see this. Uh, it's, it's kind of small and I don't know how to make it bigger, but so right now I'm halfway through some of these, like, like the Hickson eight and NGC 801 and NGC 1453. But the problem I have, I'll tell you the problem. And this is something I haven't told anybody. So just keep it a secret here. Um, do you see all these folders? Yeah. So these are all these are all completed images. So I've got clusters, good grade A, grade B, galaxies, group A, grade B, galaxies A, B, galaxy. So if I open one of these up, so these are all completed objects. And I've put A is like my grade A, and so and cool are like the top of the grade A. So as I process my X image, I've got them rank ordered. But because I've spent, uh, because I have so many clear skies here, I'm able to get this huge backlog of, of images that I'll never have time. I'll probably have never time to get to these. So this is like galaxy groups that I think are going to be okay, but not great, you know. And and so it's a nice, once you have that system set up, you know, the five hours allows me to get a lot of data. But I'm I'm at the point now where I'm almost ready to kind of trash all that and just I'm get so excited about my RASA that I'm really, um, I got to find time to do both. I got to finish this all the C11 work and then I got to have time for the rest as well. Okay, we're going to call it a night because uh, we've been through a lot of questions and we've just had a great time with you tonight, Gary. There's so many well, people who time. really appreciate this. Thanks for letting me, me share that with you. It's been a lot of work, but it's, it is it is rewarding when I can share it. and. You know, as I've, I've told, I, I don't get a chance to interact with astrophotographers at all, except through the, the keyboard. So it's it's fun to do it a little bit more, maybe not in person here, but a little more realistically. Well, you held your audience all the way through the night pretty much, but I bet if you look a week or two down the road, you'll see a few thousand people have, have viewed your presentation. Yeah. Well, thanks. Yeah, I can't see any of those comments where I'm at, so I'll take a look at those later. Thank yeah. You. yeah, they're quite laudatory. So. Good night. Uh, Terry's been in charge of us tonight. Terry? So I'm going to release my screen. Yes. yes. Stop sharing. Stop sharing. And uh, Terry, uh, can you uh, sign us out, my friend?